A number of years ago, I wrote a book uh, called The Island at the Center of the World, called New Amsterdam in Dutch, about the Dutch founding of New York. I wrote that because I was at that time living in Lower Manhattan and I lived around the corner from uh, 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 the church of St. Mark's in the Bowery. And my daughter was a toddler at the time, and just to show you how time passes, she's now in her first year of university. Uh, and the nearest open space that I could take her to run around and play was this churchyard. And the tombs of many of the early families of New York are there. And Peter Stuyvesant's tomb is there. And I knew that uh, New York was once New Amsterdam. I knew there was a Dutch presence. I knew that Peter Stuyvesant was the leader. I knew he had a wooden leg. And that's probably all I knew. Uh, but I thought, well, maybe there's more here. Uh, and, and I asked people, I asked historians. Historians of New York didn't know about the Dutch period, which uh, intrigued me further. And so I um, uh, eventually uh, discovered that uh, a man named Charles Gehring and a group of scholars around him had been uh, uh, publishing the archives of the colony and doing scholarly work on these records of this Dutch colony, which had been given a short shrift by American history. So the thesis of that book was that not only was this not an inconsequential place, but in fact, New York wouldn't have become what it did were it not first New Amsterdam, that the Dutch brought something there that made New York evolve different from Boston, say, and, and other cities in North America. Uh, I, my next book, as Ruth said, was called Descartes' Bones, and it was uh, about the actual physical bones of the Dutch philosopher René Descartes, uh, which, uh, you know, if that's all it were about, it would be a very short book, but it was actually, that was kind of a metaphor, you see, um, for, uh, 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 for things that, uh, for forces in modernity that began actually at the same time that the Dutch founded this colony in New York, uh, and that spread around the world. Um, then I uh, moved to Amsterdam and uh, was asked to be the director of the John Adams Institute. More about that a little later. Um, and I was staying at the, and I was thinking, I was still working on the Descartes Bones book, but I uh, was thinking about the next project. And I was uh, staying in the home of uh, my friend Friso Bruxma, who is here. And um, he lives on Prince Island in a wonderful house. And he, it was a house that he and his life partner, Benno Premsla, <clears throat> built together. And um, uh, they had built into it a guest apartment. And Friso told me that Benno, who had uh, earlier died, uh, had had in mind the notion of a guest apartment as a refuge relating to his time under Dauk, his time in hiding uh, during the war as a Jew. Uh, so this was um, kind of humbling to be in this apartment uh, that had at least had this kind of idea behind it. At the same time, their apartment, uh, their guest apartment was their travel library. So this whole wall is lined with books about cities all over the, all over the world. Uh, and so while I was there, I thought, well, maybe I would write a book about Amsterdam. And almost uh, simultaneous with that notion uh, came the idea that if I were to do that, I think it should be about not only a city, it should be about an idea. It should be about the idea of liberalism. Because, um, and, and as soon as I sort of developed that a little bit, it started to feel to me that any book about Amsterdam ought to be about liberalism. That's how, you know, I don't know if there are many cities that uh, are so, can be so uh, linked to an idea. And this is something, you know, you kind of test a thesis. And then as I uh, explored the history of the city and uh, people famous and not so famous associated with it, it seemed like they all, you know, the thing that, that, that made them consequential had to do in some way with this concept. Uh, I write uh, narrative history, that is, you know, I, I think of it as history in which you are focus on individuals, individual living, breathing human beings uh, who are struggling against other human beings and, uh, and against forces and, uh, and are kind of floating on these currents of, of ideas and, and forces that are, that, are, uh, that are swirling in the world around them. So you, you, what I try to do is find those uh, individuals and then while telling their story, you're, telling, you're, you're painting this backdrop of the time and the place and, and, uh, and uh, so to me that's an important, that's how I work. 
if you are talking about a, t a, a discrete time and place, that's a relatively straightforward idea. But if you are talking about, say, a thousand years of history, that's kind of a challenge. So having what I thought was a strong theme was important to me. And as I kind of tested that theme, uh, then I came to feel that, uh, and, and it sort of sounded right, then I came to feel that this is, you know, this is something that I can go with and I can have a voice with it that, that, that kind of propels it. And that's what you hope as an author. And then you just sit back and wait and to, to hear if other people think so too. Um, so I uh, uh, um, came to the notion, start, from the perspective of historians, uh, the, 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 the issues that I'm talking about, when I talk about liberalism, uh, liberalism comes, of course, from the Latin word liber, meaning free, and it means all different kinds of things to different people. And one of the things that Ambulantos and I, the Dutch publisher, we, we kind of talk, went back and forth about the subtitle in Dutch, because liberal has really a different kind of connotation. And we settled on freizinnig, which gets at closer to the meaning, but I think the English meaning of the word covers so many different things that that was actually one of the things that attracted me about it. Um, and of course it addresses, I, I liked the idea of doing something right up front that addresses you know, any of you who uh, uh, live in Amsterdam and if you uh, know people who live uh, outside the Netherlands and you say you live in Amsterdam, they immediately associate the city. You know, you know their connotations they have with it. So this would seem, I wanted a title that seemed to, to, to address that or to promise to. Uh, at the same time, more uh, at a deeper level, liberalism to me means simply a philosophy that puts the greatest value on individual freedom. And I think that that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying that Amsterdam throughout its history uh, relates to liberalism in different ways. The Enlightenment in the 18th century is the time that historians have traditionally looked at as the basis of this kind of liberalism, as this, this uh, uh, launch point of, of uh, uh, thinking and invention and uh, uh, this turning point and in which this, the, in which modernity, the force that created the, the world that we live in and, and that it created really our minds, came into being. Then uh, 20, or, 20 years ago or so, historians started to look in earnest at uh, what brought that period into being. No, nothing comes uh, into being from nothing. Uh, and so uh, a group of uh, historians started to look at the Dutch period of the Golden Age in the 17th century as being kind of the, the wellspring of, of the enlightenment of a century later. Now, if you, uh, you know, when you write a, the, the kind of book that uh, uh, I've done, you are mostly leaning on secondary sources. You can't spend all of your time in archives with the uh, primary documents uh, and, and cover a thousand years. And so I was focusing on writers who looked at Dutch history of this period and then looking behind. Well, what then was responsible for that? Why was this little corner of Europe a place where uh, this kind of change in the way people think uh, came about? Why did it happen here? And of course, then I was more concentrated in focusing on the city of Amsterdam. And following in the work of others, I was fascinated by the stream that looks at the, goes back to the Middle Ages, and certainly there are a number of Dutch cities that, that are much older that were founded in the Roman era, but by and large, uh, the, this corner of Europe was settled uh, in a meaningful way in the Middle Ages. And it was uh, people's uh, struggle against water that defined their society. If you think about society in the rest of Europe during the Middle Ages, you can kind of neatly compact. We all have an image of it in our minds, and it is what is called the manorial system, where you have a, a nobleman, and in your mind's eye, he lives in a castle, and uh, around the castle are his grounds, and there are peasants or serfs who, who work on those grounds and who work for him, and their whole lives are kind of uh, in his service. They pay uh, him taxes, and he in turn provides them with protection. And this is a fixed system. You know, if you're born into it, wherever you're born into it, your children, you know, will have the same uh, place in the system, and their children will. 
And it has to do with, a relation, with, with land. And I'm someone who thinks that a lot of history, uh, a lot of culture can be explained initially. Of course, there's a million things at play. But initially, uh, in terms of the relationship to land, and especially so, I think, with places uh, that where, where the climate is inhospitable, uh, people, uh, cultures in, in the desert or in, in Alaska or on high mountaintops. And that is the case in this part of Europe, which is essentially a vast river delta, so that people had to uh, reclaim land, whether it was act literally underwater or, or not uh, function, not usable, they reclaimed a lar large portions of their land. And in the act of doing this, um, they then had a new relationship to it because it wasn't owned previously by a monarch or by a king. They had created it or made it usable. And after they did that, they began buying and selling. They, they divided it up so that everyone got a portion and, and they began buying and selling and renting it and they created then a kind of proto-modern uh, economy. This, I, I found this really fascinating, this aspect of how this part of the world, uh, how, the, the, how Dutch culture came into being. And from that then, uh, you, see, you see a kind of uh, different uh, identity form. And it, because it seems to offer possibilities. Because if I can uh, buy and sell land and I can become wealthier, I can buy things, I can make my life more comfortable, I can give my family more opportunities. And as that happens, then my children uh, grow up with that notion in mind. So it, it allows for the, the, the notion of um, innovation, of people um, who can start to make changes for, for the betterment of themselves and society. I'll, I'll sketch a, a quick little uh, succession of, of things to, to try to make the point. In the Middle Ages, uh, everybody in Northern Europe fished for herring. It was uh, reasonably plentiful and, and uh, nutritious. Or nutritious. Uh, the Swedes, uh, the, the Dutch, everybody, everybody did it, and they sold it to each other. Um, the Dutch then started, a, uh, developed a couple of innovations that allowed them to corner the market. One was they uh, discovered that if you pack the herring after you gut it, you pack it with a little bit of the liver. The liver has an enzyme that preserves it so that it will last much longer. Once you've done that, that means that, at least technically, you can go out further to sea and you can have build up more of an industry, more of a business fishing for herring. Uh, that, though, required yet another innovation, and that was the development of a different kind of fishing vessel, uh, which was known as a herring bus, which was essentially a factory for processing fish that could plow through heaving waters of the, of the North Sea. So these fleets came into being, with herring buses and with fishing vessels accompanying them and sort of police boats because this was a valuable commodity. Uh, and this whole elaborate industry with lots of different people, different occupations associated with it. So, you know, one innovation put together with another innovation and this whole industry comes into being. The Dutch then cornered the market on herring. Amsterdam's rise began uh, with herring, you might say. Uh, that then leads to other developments. Uh, uh, as they're becoming shippers and trans-shippers, they see products in one port in one part of Europe, uh, uh, the, the raw materials for soap, and, and they realize that they, what, what they decide they'll do something with it. So they bring them back to Amsterdam. At one time, there were, I think, 21 soap works uh, in Amsterdam. And then they sold, the, they sold this soap uh, in Europe, and they colored it. They colored it green as a kind of branding so that they were, um, uh, you, if you were buying soap in Italy or England and it was green, you kind of associated that with, uh, with Dutch soap, in this case with Amsterdam soap. Um, similarly, the herring they packed and they labeled, the province of Holland labeled it Holland herring. And so they, the, all these things kind of uh, flow one from the other. Uh, as they begin, as they expand this network, then they get more bold, and they think they think finally that you know this is all this kind of rough trade they're dealing with, with these heavy items. But the rich trade of uh, uh, high cost goods was the stuff that came from the East Indies, and the Portuguese controlled that. So the next innovation was to develop a system to, to develop some changes to the concept of a company. They form a company. 
which is different from other companies that had uh, existed up to that time. Companies to that time, people got together and it was sharing risk. You, you, you all agree to put in a certain amount of money, you buy your ships, you, you uh, staff your crew, you send them out to get whatever it is you want to get, they bring it back, and you divide it up and the company's finished. The FAOSA, the Dutch East India Company, uh, transformed the world in innumerable ways. It was the largest company in existence to that time. It, it shipped plants and animals all over the world, creating this cycle of invasive species that we're still dealing with. It exploited peoples. It, it, it did all sorts of uh, remarkable things, positive and negative. Um, maybe the most remarkable is that it, uh, developed, it changed the concept of a company, so that a company, it was a company that would continue to exist. It wouldn't end when the voyage ended. And what that meant, and what they said on the first page of the, uh, the, the IPO, you would call it, when they put out the announcement, was that you could buy shares of it and later you could sell them because the, val the company would stay around and its value would go up and down. Uh, and this was also a, uh, a public-private uh, operation. The, the, the government was involved at different levels. Wealthy individuals were involved. And not so wealthy individuals were involved. I think there were seven or eight people who listed themselves as housekeepers who, were, who signed on, who bought shares in the company. So this new kind of uh, entity comes into being, and it becomes intimately associated with Amsterdam. And, it's, and Amsterdam rises and in, in the Golden Age, and the, the, the Dutch Republic does, and the VOC does all together. And uh, the, the, as the VOC expands and all this wealth comes flooding into Amsterdam, the city is physically transformed. They decide then they will carve a new city around the medieval center. These three canals, this ring of canals around it, tripling the size of the city, hundreds and hundreds of houses and roads and bridges, which they do in a, in a span of 60 or 70 years, digging the canals uh, out by hand, creating these, uh, these houses and bridges by hand, backbreaking work. Um, once again doing kind of mirroring what was done earlier where you have uh, people in small settlements deciding as a group that they will uh, cordon off an area and, and with dams and dikes uh, uh, reclaim that area and, and, and for the common good and also so that individuals can gain. So they craft, they craft this city and they do it in such a way, they do it with an attention to the individual, to individual comfort, and, and we, th th this is the first city that, uh, in which they develop street lighting, in which there is a, a public uh, fire company. Uh, and others, visitors came to the city to study it, to, to try to copy some of these elements. So this was, there was something going on here, and this is get back, getting back to this, the theme of the individual, of uh, liberalism. Focus on the individual and the and individual worth is not something that, that exists simply in, in, at the level of philosophy. It's in, the, it's in the canals of Amsterdam. People could, an individual merchant could travel from Asia all the way into the eye on a ship laden with his goods and then transfer them to a smaller vessel and ride up the canal right to his doorstep and with the hoist beam loaded up, loaded up upstairs. So it was like tailor-made for this to support commerce and to support the individual. Uh, as, this, as the golden age explodes, you know, all, all, everything, as I said before, everything kind of can relate back to this concept of empowering the individual or valuing the individual. Um, one fascinating thing, there's a writer named Witold Rybyshinsky who wrote a, a wonderful book called Home in which he explores the history of the idea of home as an intimate uh, private space. And he argues that the Dutch canal house of the 17th century is the place where home was invented. <clears throat> Meaning that the idea of, you know, before that in cities, you think of Paris in the Middle Ages and you think these big uh, blocks where you had uh, lots of people who, you know, interrelated families and servants and others uh, all living around sort of a central courtyard and compare that to uh, a Dutch canal house which is really meant for a husband and a wife and their children and for business. So the, the, the business takes place on the ground level and the, and the products can be stored upstairs. Um, so that it's, it's actually, this co concept is in the uh, physical structure of the city. 
It's uh, in, as I say, in the, the, the economics behind it, the way the VOC came into being, the, the, the system that was built around it. Uh, you know, as soon as, so, uh, as soon as it was formed, as soon as the VOC was formed, then on the Neuebruch, right opposite Central Station, uh, you had people beginning to buy and sell and trade pieces of paper, which were the original shares of this company. So the concept of shares of stock comes to being, and people are, after a couple of years, people are getting tired of doing this, you know, in, in the rain, and, and they build a stock exchange uh, just on the other side of the Damrak to house this activity. All around it, ancillary uh, uh, functions come into being, insurance and, and, and the desire to, they, they, the next innovation, they, they hit on the idea that in these deeply uncertain times, uncertainty was terrible for business. You know, if a, if a, ves if a, a, a fleet sinks with, that has late, that's laden with spices, your economy is ruined. If the plague sweeps through one season, your economy is ruined. So they tried to structure the city in such a way that it could withstand some of these shocks so that it would be good for business. So that even their enemies then would see this as a value and do business with them. So they made Amsterdam, and the reason all these pockhausen are here, all these warehouses, they were making it into a storehouse, a kind of analog Amazon.com, you know, where everything was there, you know, and you could, and so they, they, they stockpiled spices to keep, because they had this experience of the prices going up and down and up and down, and that was chaotic, so they were trying to regulate it. You see in a very different way, you see this, uh, what I'm calling liberalism, in uh, the art that developed, and everybody in Europe very quickly was fascinated by the art of the Dutch provinces because it was, for one thing, it was, it was turned somewhat away from religious themes. It was, these were still very religious people, but they were, very, they were interested suddenly in something else. They were interested not just in pictures of, of Christ on the cross and biblical stories. They were interested in uh, a woman on the street selling fish, or a woman in a house pouring milk into a bowl. Uh, just ordinary people doing ordinary things. If you think about Rembrandt, we think of him today as famous, as a genius, uh, related to his uh, dexterity, his wondrous way with so many different genres. At the time, his... Um, his uh, uh, his fame, his initial fame, came from his way with portraits, his way of uh, painting people, not just so that he seemed to paint what they looked like, but who they were. And that gives you a clue that people were suddenly fascinated by that, by what was going on behind someone's eyes, by who, who is this person, or are you wanting to see people, people to think, who am, who am I, who's this person? So you have these ordinary merchants and their wives posing for portraits by Rembrandt, and these are unspecial people, and yet they're, they're, um, they have Wikipedia pages. They, uh, they're, people stand in front of them in, in uh, the Rijksmuseum and in the Hermitage and in the Metropolitan Museum in New York and stare at them still because they were these <clears throat> first people who, who were sort of participating in this act of self-awareness that we, that we do. There was something different from, I mean, just to take another uh, uh, way of looking at that, Spinoza, who uh, I, I'll kind of, I, he's the heart of my book, but I'll, I'll, I don't have time to spend much uh, time talking about him, but I'll just uh, say that whenever he was excommunicated from the synagogue in Amsterdam, he didn't say, okay, I'll, 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 I'll join other sects. He basically became a citizen of the world, which is the strangest thing at the time, because up until that time, you, your identity was part of a group. Um, and this, you know, today people can go to be, be part of a club or a religion or not, and we don't think anything of it. But it was really, I mean, if you think about it, that step of his, in a way, was as radical as his philosophy, or was an exp uh, exponent of, of his whole philosophy, which said, you know, we're, I'm going to break from what I think is the superstitious element of the Bible. We're going to focus on the individual. Spinoza, um, was fascinated by the development of a republic in his country and in his city and, and Johann de Witt and everything that they were doing and it came, it all came crashing down. But he uh, was fascinated by it and built it into his philosophy. Um, this whole association of, of the city in particular, the city of Amsterdam, the development of uh, what came into being here then got uh, spread around the world. The Dutch, uh, the, the, the golden age ended 
I would say in 1672. So anyway, sometime in the late 1600s. Um, but the spread uh, continued. It went on and on through all different kinds of uh, vehicles. One I, was the subject of my earlier book, uh, where this society planted a different society in North America on, based on this island called Manhattan. And uh, the things that I think made that society unique were these two elements that they brought with them. It was a mixed society, which, by the way, the Dutch Republic was uniquely mixed in Europe. Strain, uh, uh, English travelers in Amsterdam would write you know, with amazement at seeing people with turbans and people with dark skin. Uh, so this mixed society came along to Manhattan, and this Dutch approach to trade came along. And if you think about it, those two ingredients are a recipe for New York. So, and if, you, and if you jump ahead into the 19th century, when you've got these great waves of immigrants coming from Europe to North America, by and large, they landed in Manhattan and they saw what was by then this teeming mix of people speaking all different languages and somehow not killing each other or not often killing each other, uh, and, and uh, uh, struggling by what we would call upward mobility. And they said, well, this is America. And it wasn't America, it was New York. And it was New York because it had been New Amsterdam. So this is one avenue by which this spread. Another avenue is this relationship between the Dutch Republic and England during the 17th century. They were like two rival siblings who were kind of always at each other, um, but always fascinated by each other. And if you think about these two empires, the Dutch Empire and the British Empire, the Dutch uh, uh, took off much quicker. The British Empire was slower to take off and it lasted much longer. But uh, because of that, I think, with all of this uh, interest in each other, it was, uh, it was mostly the English who were benefiting. The English historian Lisa Jardine wrote a book a few years ago called Going Dutch, in which she, she essentially argues that a lot of the British Empire was built on Dutch innovations from, from the Golden Age. Uh, with people, and she uh, goes through uh, everything from garden design to microscopes to uh, uh, small industries and innovations in industry and in clock making. Uh, so this whole century, while this, these things are developing here, the English are slowly, are steadily borrowing them. And that comes to a climax in 1688, which the, 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 the event that the English kind of spin doctored into the glory revolution, which was actually an invasion. The Dutch Stadthalder, uh, Willem, became, invaded England and became King William. And that was kind of the cap of this whole period of, uh, by which the English borrowed things from the Dutch. And from there, of course, with the British Empire, they, these things went further and further. Um, I, 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 I think I've only brought the story up to 1688, and um, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd love to keep going, but I want to I, I um, uh, stop and, and uh, do a few other things, and then Tracy and I are going to talk. But um, uh, I, I want to go back to one thing. Uh, one thing that I think is really interesting about, so all of this expands now, and the, the Dutch title of my book, I mean, the English title of my book, the subtitle was, uh, is uh, History of the World's Most Liberal City. And as soon as I said that to a couple of Dutch friends, they said, no, it isn't, which I think is wonderfully Dutch. And, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, I, 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 I don't disagree with that. You know, I think it's worth, uh, you know, combating that, because I think, you know, partly what I mean by that is historically, what I was just talking about, the Amsterdam was at the, at the forefront. But it's, the city's now in kind of a funny position where it created this, a lot of these things started here. Not everything. I'm, I'm, I'm working in, in, you know, in lines that people can, that we can uh, talk about in, a, in an hour. Um, but a lot of things started here and it became now part of the DNA of, of, of cities all over the world. And there are cities that are a lot bigger and that have a lot more force. And so it's questionable whether um, Amsterdam has that same role. Although, interestingly, I think a difference between Amsterdam now and in the 17th century is Amsterdam is aware. Amsterdam's leaders now kind of use this liberalism as a brand. You know, they want people to come in and look at their bicycle trails and the way they, in the, the way they innovate. So they're aware of this, this history and they want to... Uh, uh, use that as a way to, to bring the city further along. Uh, one more thing I'll say is that the, um, 
the the Dutch throughout uh, throughout all throughout history in the 19th century liberalism had become so big that it basically split into two forces. You had economic liberalism and social liberalism. Economic liberals uh, argued that. Um, they should be completely free to do business and to make money. Social liberals said, well, yeah, by doing that, you're, you're making workers into, uh, building them into a, in a position of poverty. So social liberalism and all of its flavors, communism and socialism, came into being. And these have been the defining forces ever since. And they've caused wars and they've caused uh, civil wars. I think it's interesting that the Netherlands has never kind of been torn apart by it. The Netherlands keeps trying to keep these things together in a way that I think is unlike any other place. Um, and I, I guess as an American this strikes me because if you look at the US right now, it's a situation where you know polarization is such that it's brought the government to a halt. And you get the feeling that these people would rather see the whole thing and the whole world economy go down the drain rather than sit, stay at the same table and, and hash things out. Um, so uh, for, all, uh, of, uh, for all it has been maligned, I think there is a lot of good in the Polder model and in um, the notion, and in keeping in mind the notion that in some way we're all liberals.